Amen. All right, this morning, we're going to start out this morning with a little exercise. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're all going to stand up and do some jumping jacks. No, I'm just kidding. What we're going to do is we're going to do a mental exercise here. We're going to have a thought experiment right at the beginning of our sermon um, this morning. And I want you to think right now, I want you to close your eyes, or if you don't have to close your eyes, but I want you to think of the great men in the Bible. And I want you to think of some names in your mind right now. Think of the great men in the Bible. So some names probably pop into your head. Maybe some of you are thinking about like Jacob or Abraham or some of these great names in the Bible. So that's pretty easy, right? To think of the great men in the Bible. There's lots of great names in the Bible. Noah, I mean, another great name in the Bible. Moses, great name in the Bible. So there's a lot of great men in the Bible. Now what I want you to do is think of the great fathers in the Bible. Just think for a minute. What's wrong? What's the problem? There's not a lot, is there? It's hard to actually think of a great father in the Bible. And as I was thinking about Father's Day and I was thinking about a sermon for Father's Day, it's actually hard. You actually have to have studied the Bible a little bit to actually know of some names of men who were actually good fathers in the Bible. And it's, it's, it's an interesting question. It's an interesting problem. We're going to look at it both this morning and this evening. So we're going to look at, this morning we're going to look at a very specific man in the Bible. We're going to look at this man called Jonadab in the Bible. We're going to look at him. We're going to look at his legacy. And we'll look at, more importantly, we're going to look at his methodology on how he did things. Because look, I mean... We found, you know, we can find a great man in the Bible who is also um, a great father in the Bible. But if we can't learn from other people in our lives, I mean, what's the point, right? I mean, what, what are we doing? We're just walking through life blind. So what I want to do is I want to look at this man, Jonadab, in the Bible. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 10. We're going to look at, you know, what he was, a who he was, what he was able to do, and more importantly than that, you know, how was he able to do it? It's very important that we understand the methodology of someone who's successful. Because look, if somebody's successful at a certain thing, I want to know, like, how they prosecuted that success. How did they make that happen, right? So we're going to look at that this morning with this man, Jonadab. And many people in the Bible, maybe, maybe many people haven't even heard of Jonadab. So let's first look at who he actually was. He's mentioned by these people in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 35, but he's not in that story. We have to go back um, several generations to find out who Jonadab actually was. So if you turn to 2 Kings chapter 10, let's just do a little bit of a Bible study here and find out who this man was. 2 Kings chapter 10. So in 2 Kings chapter 10, we have the story of Jehu. So basically, Jehu was anointed king by God. You know, he was chosen by God to wipe out the house, the evil house of Ahab in the northern kingdom of Israel. So Jehu is prosecuting this war against Ahab's family. Jehu is doing a good job. He has killed Ahab. He has killed his son. He has killed all 70 of Ahab's sons. He has killed kings, the kings from you know, um, he killed Ahaziah, the king of the lower kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah, because he was married in and tied into the family of Ahab. We've looked at that extensively. He actually even killed the brethren of Ahaziah, who has come to visit um, their brother. So, I mean, he is cleaning house. He is wiping out not only the entire house of Ahab, but anyone tied to that um, that dynasty. And Jehu is doing a complete job at it. And here we see someone coming to visit Jehu when he's in the midst of this, um, this command by God. And look at 2 Kings chapter 10 and verse number 15. And when he was departed thence, the Bible says, he lighted on Jonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said to him, Is thine heart right, as my heart is right with the Lord? And Jonadab answered, It is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand and took him up into the chariot. Now, this is the same story where Ahaziah's brethren came to him and met Jehu. And, you know, Jehu took them down to the river and killed them all. 
Okay, so here Jonadab comes, this man Jonadab, he comes, he seeks out, he comes to meet Jehu. He seeks him out. He's going to help him. He's looking, he knows what Jehu is doing, and he seeks Jehu out to come help him, and he actually gets up in the chariot and goes to help Jehu. Look at verse 16. And he said, come with me, Jehu says, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot. So Jonadab is there to help. He's there to help the man of God prosecute the commandment of God. Look at verse 17. And when he came to Samaria, he slew all that remained unto Ahab in Samaria, till he had destroyed him according to the saying of the Lord, which he spake to Elijah. And Jehu gathered all the people together and said unto them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu shall serve him much. So, of course, now he's going to clean house in the house of Baal. All right? So he says, hey, you know, I really want to serve Baal. And he's trying to get all the prophets of Baal to come and be like, oh, Jehu is for Baal. Right? So Jehu is, is doing some trickery here. Now, therefore, call unto me all the prophets of Baal, all his servants and all his priests, let none be wanting, for I have great sacrifice to do to Baal. Whosoever shall be wanting, he shall not live. But Jehu did it in subtlety, to the intent that he might destroy the worshipers of Baal. And Jehu said, Proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal, and they proclaimed it. And Jehu sent through all Israel, and all the worshipers, I mean, he wants to get them all. So he sends messengers all around saying, I'm having a big festival for Baal. Big sacrifice. If you're for Baal, you need to be part of this. So that there was not a man left that came not, and they came into the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was full from one end to the other. So here we had Jehu, you know, he's out and he's, he's cleaning house in the house of Ahab. Je Jonadab joined him in verse number 15, but look, Jonadab is still with him. Jonadab is still prosecuting this with Jehu. Look at verse 22. And he sent unto him all that was over the vestry, bring forth vestments for all the worshipers of Baal, and they brought forth vestments. And then look down at verse 23. And Jehu went, and Jonadab, the son of Rechab, so he's still there, he's still helping Jehu, into the house of Baal, and said unto the worshipers of Baal, search, and look that there be here with you none of the servants of the Lord, but the worshipers of Baal only. So he wants to be, he's careful too. It's kind of nice, right? He doesn't want to accidentally kill like some, some righteous people, right? So he makes sure that they check. And, but I want to point out, number, number one, that Jonadab sought Jehu out. He not only sought him out, but he stuck with him until the job was done, and including this, um, this destruction of the worshipers of Baal. So, of course, after this story, you know, they, they, they just kill everybody. They kill all the prophets of Baal, and they just clean house, okay? But he helped Jehu clear Baal from the land. He was, he was jealous for the Lord, Jonadab. He was jealous for the Lord. He was basically became, what he basically became was Jehu's right-hand man in, in this uh, prosecution, okay? I mean, he was right there. He helped him um, with all, with this difficult task. So, but look, that's all we see in the Bible about the life of Jonadab, what I just read you. And that's it, okay? Because, so how could you say, like, how can you say that he's this, he's this great father and he did all these things, you know, that were great, and, and how could you use him for a Father's Day sermon? And the reason that I can do that is because, go back to Jeremiah chapter 35, the reason that I can say that Jonadab was a great father was because of the legacy that he left behind. That's how we can see. We can see it from the results, period. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 35. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 35, the Bible says that these are sons of Jonadab. Okay, now, but look. In the Bible, when you're reading, and it says sons, and it says daughters in the Bible, you can't, you can't just assume that that's the very next generation. Um, Athaliah, in the Bible, was called a daughter of Omri, but she was really his granddaughter. Okay, so what I'm trying to get you to understand is that sons and daughters could mean great, you know, grandsons, great grandsons. What it means is that they came from that line of that man or of that woman. Okay, now look, 
this story in Jeremiah chapter 35 is 150 to 200 years after Jehu and Jonadab went and cleaned house in the house of Baal. All right. So look, these are these people that we read about in Jeremiah chapter 35. These are great, 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 great grandsons and, and granddaughters that we're talking about here. Okay. So when it says the sons of Jonadab, uh, that's what it's talking about. They're still talking about you know their father Jonadab. The legacy. I mean, that's powerful. The legacy still stands at that point 200 years later. Now look, that's, that's atypical in the Bible. If you, if you read the Bible, most men, even great men of the Bible, which we'll even look at tonight, even great men of the Bible, like David, had a problem passing that legacy down to the very next generation. I mean, forget, you know, five, six, seven generations out, this man created a legacy 200 years after he lived. That's impressive. So how in the world did he do it? So this morning what I want to talk to you about, all of that was matter of introduction. This morning what I want to talk to you about is the influence of a father. The influence of of a father. Well, I mean, is it important? I mean, how can you do it right? How can you do it wrong? Look, I mean, there, like, when secular people have figured things out, that means that it is a super obvious truth that can't be denied. Okay? So, look, secular studies have shown that the, the father in the home makes, is, is a huge factor in how you know the family turns out the children turn out I mean there's been study after study after study I'm not gonna sit here and just read studies off to you but there's been all these studies that basically say you know children the way the secular world will put it children who are raised by a father who is married to their mother right and then there's all these statistics which basically says children who are are you know raised by their own father in a normal Christian home is what they're actually trying to say. But look, there's all these studies that say that children who are raised by a father that is, you know, married to their mother, you know, the home is safer. You can read entire books on that one variable, on how the home is safer. Because look, they're, the father that's married to their mother, their dad, is a protector. Right, he is there to protect the house. He will protect the home. He'll protect his children from you know, all sorts of wicked, you know, influences that are everywhere today. So that's, you know, what fathers do. I mean, you don't have to be a Christian father, Bible-believing father, to, you know, want to protect your children. It's a natural instinct. So look, also, there's also all kinds of studies out there that show that a man who's married and has children is much less likely to be an abusive person. To, you know, abuse... Um, drugs and alcohol and abuse, you know, children or other people's children. It, it's just a, it's a, it's, it, there's all kinds of, it's just the way it is. It just turns out that way. There's all sorts of studies out there that show that children who are raised by a father who's married to their mother, they're like 80% less likely to go to prison. Makes sense, right? There was a book I read many years ago called uh, Bringing Up Boys by uh, James Dobson. I used to read all these books by Focus on the Family and all this kind of stuff, which, you know, there, there's a lot of good truths in these books. But this, this interesting thing in this book that still sticks with me today is that this man in this book went and he interviewed men in prison. And he found that to the tune of like 98%, 98% of men in prison, I mean, we found something that, uh, we found a trend. And you can say 98% have this characteristic, you have found a trend. 98% of men in prison hate their father. Wow. Red flag. Do you think the father in the home matters? Right? So look, they're more, look, they've, they've done all kinds of studies that show that children that are raised by men who are married to their mother are much more empathetic to people in their life. They have more feelings towards others in their life. You know, they're um, here's another good one. 
you think that just some kids are born smart and some kids are born stupid? That's not how it works. It's not what the Bible says. You know, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There's actually been books written out there that show that children who are raised by fathers who are married to their mother are smarter. It's not genetic. Right? I mean, it kind of matches what the Bible says. Right? So, you know, dads, you can literally make your kids stupid by being a bad dad. I mean, that's kind of what that says. But the Bible kind of told us that already, right? So there's all, look, the list goes on and on and on, on on all these things. So like, what I'm trying to get you to understand is you have the power to make or break the situation, Dad, with your children. Like I said, no pressure. You can wreck it all or you can make it all, period. They have tremendous influence on the positive and the negative, all right? I mean, like I said, when the secular world figures it out, that means that it's a truth that is so obvious that, that even they couldn't deny it. But the Bible told us this already, right. right? So the question is, how did Jonadab do it? I mean, there's not much about him in the Bible, right? We just read everything about Jonadab in the Bible. But look, using other Bible truths, we can infer some things about Jonadab's parenting, all right? Now, here's the prerequisite. The first point is just a prerequisite that you need to have is like a base. And it's this. He was on the right side of the Lord. Period. Jonadab was on the right side. We see this in his life. The Bible also tells us this. And look, turn to James chapter 1. He was on the right side of the Lord. Period. So if you're, you know, you're a dad and you're not on the right side of God... You, you're lacking that foundation. You're, you're starting out um, fighting a losing battle already. Look at James chapter 1 and verse 17. The Bible says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Look, any good gift is coming from God. So you need to be on the right side of God if you're a father. And you want to have good things and pass good things and create this, this good um, th thing for your family, you need to be on the right side of God. That needs to be the starting point. All right, look, he had great zeal. He had Jehu's zeal for the Lord. He had great zeal for the Lord. And look, look it, was, it was not just zeal that he just had like in his heart. Where he's just like, I'm just, I just feel. He did. His works were based on his zeal for the Lord. It was seen in, his, in, in what he did in his life. You don't think that Jonadab's kids and grandkids and great-grandkids weren't talking about the great works that he did for the Lord for generations? Of course they were. It's, it's memorialized in the Bible. We're still talking about it today. And we're not even related to him. So he had great zeal which was connected to work for the Lord. Amen. Do you? That's the base. That's, that's where you, you, you start. He went, and I mean, he actually fought. He actually had to physically fight for the Lord. You know, we don't have to physically fight for the Lord today. Yet. Who knows what's coming next week. <laughs> but I mean, the point is that you know, we don't have, I mean, he had this great zeal that was, he put his feet to the action of that zeal, see? So zeal without action, it's another sermon. But it's worthless. It's worthless to others. Okay? See James chapter 2. Second, so can your family see your zeal? That's the first thing to think about. Can your family, can your wife, can your children, can they see your zeal? How do they see your zeal? Through your works. Through what you do for the Lord, just like what Jonadab did. Okay? The second thing is this. Jonadab established, and we're going to talk about this. I've already, I, you guys have heard me bring up this word. I'm going to talk about this word today. I'm going to talk about this word tonight. And, but what Jonadab did is he established a culture in his family. 
He established a culture. Now look, what, what is a culture? A culture is different than rules. Okay, I've talked a lot about the culture that we want to have in this church. I'm going to continue to talk about the culture that we need to have in this church. I'm going to continue to talk about until I'm blue in the face about the culture that we need to have here. A culture is different than rules. A culture is different than, hey, um, you just need to do this. Right? I talked to this about the ushers even this morning. And it, here's the culture that we need to put forth here. Here's the, it's it's just different than just do this and do that and do this. Culture, look, turn to 2 Kings chapter 12. Let's look at a comparison of culture versus rules. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 12. And we're just going to read one verse, but let me, I mean, this is the story of Joash, which is Athaliah's grandson. So Athaliah is the wicked, you know, um, great, you know, granddaughter of Omri, the daughter of Ahab. She married into the, the house of Judah. And she goes when Ahaziah is killed, and she kills all her grandchildren. So she can rule. Nice lady. Of course, the priest Jehoiada steps in, and actually, you know, his aunt saves him first. You know, Joash's aunt saves him, and then Jehoiada, the priest, he takes Joash under his wing. So they save this one child. And you know what's funny? It's a good thing they saved that child, because God promised that that line would never be broken in Judah. So God used Jehoiada and Joash's aunt to keep Joash, because if Joash would have died, God's promise wouldn't have come true. Of course, God's in control always, so he protects Joash. They save this young boy from being killed by his grandmother, and he is raised by this priest. He is raised by Jehoiada. And look at 2 Kings chapter 12 and verse number 2. And the Bible says, And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days. Oh, but wait. Wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. So, if the, if the sentence would have end, ended all his days, the story would have been much better. Right? But it says, Joash did all that was right in the sight of the Lord all his days which Jehoiada instructed him. So here Jehoiada instructed him, but guess what happened to Jehoiada? He died. Because, you know, he was older, he was raising Joash, and he died. Guess what? I mean, I mean, hopefully I die before my children. Because I'm older, so I'm going to die. I'm not going to always be here for my children. I will get old and die one day. I could die tomorrow or today. Who knows? But the point is that, you know, parents will not always be there to instruct their children. And what happened is, when Jehoiada died, Joash went off the rails. He went off the rails, he started listening to these princes. I mean, isn't that how it always starts, by the way? You start listening to other people that, you know, see some cracks in the armor, and they come in and they exploit those things. But he starts listening to these princes. He actually ends up killing Jehoiada's children. He kills Jehoiada's sons. The man that raised him. The man that, I mean, it actually ends up costing Joash his life. Because conspirators came against Joash and killed him for the blood of Jehoiada's sons. Of what he did. All right? So look. Jehoiada wasn't able to get a culture instilled in Joash. He raised him. He gave him rules. Look. He, he did what was right while Jehoiada was, 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 was there, but he never bought into it. Because as soon as Jehoiada was gone, it was just easy to derail him. Right? But look, now compare this. Go back to Jeremiah 35. Compare this to Jehona, Jonadab's great, 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 great grandchildren. Compare this. Think about it. Jehoiada dies and almost immediately, the kid goes crazy. But look at Jeremiah 35 and verse number 2. So they were supposed to go, you know, this was a test for, for the Rechabites, right? Go unto the house, the Bible says, go into the house of the Rechabites and speak unto them and bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers and give them wine to drink. Look down at verse number 6. But they said, we will drink no wine. Why? For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, 
commanded us, saying, like, remember, this is their great, 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 great grandfather. Commanded us, saying, ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. He established this culture in his family forever. Or at least for these generations so far. I mean, look, 150, 200 years later, this culture still stands. I mean, first of all, what a great culture to establish. Men. Yeah. I mean, men, you know, did you know that you can establish a culture in your family? Yeah. I mean, you can establish a generational culture in your family. It's possible. Jonadab did it here. I mean, you think about, you know, I mean, just think about this culture of, of drinking, that this, this culture of, of, of no alcohol. I mean, just think about Jonadab's specific culture that the Bible talks about here. I mean, you can establish that as a culture. Look, you should establish everything in your family as a culture, but specifically today, this one is a great one to start off with, right? Because look, everybody's a drunk. <laughs> it, it seems like that sometimes. I mean, to establish, you should establish this culture where, look, uh, you know, it, it, it's weird to see people drink. That's what your kids should, should realize. They should see somebody standing there, you know, if they ever see a person with a beer or a drink in their hand, it should be like, whoa, that's a culture that you're establishing for your children. Look, I remember, you know, my, my grandfather established a culture in many ways in our family. My, my grandfather, he established um, this culture of just being this upright man. You know, he, 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 his reputation was he fought in World War II, he worked hard, he was an honest, God-fearing man. When I, moved, when I moved out to the farm, and I took over the farm, people would come to me, and if, you know, the neighbors or whatever, they come to do business or whatever, they would always start off conversations with, I knew your grandfather. And that was kind of like, they're kind of putting, they're, they're kind of like, I knew the kind of man your grandfather is. What kind of man are you? That's what they're saying. That's what they're saying. So, I mean, it was, a, it was something, it was a bar. It was a bar that he had set. You know, I was warned as a kid. I was warned as a kid by my dad. You ever get in any kind of trouble, you're going to stand before your grandfather and tell him what you did. That, I mean, that's the kind of man that he was. And I'm like, I'm never, never doing that. You know, report cards, grades in school, as you get older, any kind of trouble in high school or something, he's like, you're going to get into this kind of trouble, you're going to stand and you're going to tell your grandfather what you did. Because, look, he had established a culture in his family that made it even to my generation. I mean, think about it. Like, but, look, here's the difference. Okay, here's the difference between a culture and rules. The difference between Jehoiada and Jonadab. To, get a, to establish a culture, you need to create buy-in. You need to get the buy-in of the people in the next generation. You need to get people on board. You need to get people, look, otherwise it's just rules. Otherwise it's just rules. And you know what, to get people's buy-in, you know what the main thing that is needed? The main thing that is needed is time. Look, I spent a lot of time with my grandfather. I mean, I remember riding around in a combine with him in this tiny little combine, and the only place for me to sit was like smashed up in the corner, up behind his seat, and like it was the most uncomfortable thing in the world. But I'd have sat there for days. But it's, that's what establishes a culture is time. And then you just sit there and you just talk and we would just yell at each other in the combine because he was deaf anyway and then plus the machine we're just screaming at each other all day long. But that is what it takes to establish a culture. It's the base. You need to spend that time. And you can see this. So look, I can tell you one thing. Jonadab spent the time. How do you know? Because I see it from the results. That's how I know. Let's look at another great father in the Bible. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. Another man who I can tell you, he spent the time. He spent the time. Let's look at a man called Zebedee in the Bible. Look, his name is mentioned like 11 times. Most of the time his name is mentioned, he's not even in the story. 
Okay, there's only one verse in the Bible where Zebedee's actually there. And he's never quoted one time in the Bible. You never hear one word from Zebedee in the Bible. So, how do you know Zebedee was a great father? Are you just inferring all this stuff? No, I know from the results. I know because I know who James and John were. I know because when Jesus said, you know, these sons, the sons of thunder, I know that, you know, two men that were the top list of the apostles who would have served Christ to their very death. I know who their father was. You see? Look at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 21. I know that Zebedee spent the time. Look at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 21. The Bible says this, And going forth and going on from thence, he saw, this is the calling of James and John. He saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. So look, he's spending time here. He's spending time working side by side with his children. And by the character of his children, we know who he was. Turn to Proverbs chapter 29. So the first culture that you need to establish is this. The first culture that you need to establish is spending time. That is your base culture. That is your base level that you build from to establish all other cultures is spending time. Look at Proverbs 29, 15. A verse we all know well. The Bible says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Look at that word, those, those words that say, but a child left to himself. That child is not spending time with his father or his mother. He's left alone. So look, you better spend time with your kids. And here's the easy thing about spending time with your kids, dads. It's pre-programmed in them to want to spend time with you. Yeah. <laughs> right? But look, let me tell you something. As a parent of older children, this program can change. This program can change. Look, I don't know how many times I've had people with kids my age and, and kids 13, 14 years old tell me that even before my kids were that age, oh, when they turn 13, they're going to want to have nothing to do with you. They're going to go crazy when they turn 13. That's because you did it wrong. That's because, you know, you didn't spend that time. When you had that program, when you had that hardwired hard -wired child that wanted to spend time with his dad and his mom, you, you didn't. And so, you know, other people decided that they would influence them and come into their life. My, my kids have never gone through this weird stage. Amen. Never. And, you know, if they ever did, I would just force them to hang out with me anyway. <laughs> so, look, I was, doing, I was doing some reflecting this week. I was doing some reflecting on you know, just being a father and things that I could have done better and what, you know, what are some things that, you know, that I think I could change or do better? Because look, I mean, I've told you this before, I'm not a perfect parent. I never have been. I'm not today. But look, the one thing that popped up to me, and look, I've spent a lot of time with my kids, but look, I wish I had more. I wish I had more. I was, you know, I was thinking about, about fishing. You know, some of the guys went fishing. I've just been thinking about fishing lately. And look, I used to go fishing with the kids a lot. We used to fish a lot. There was this canal by, um, by the farm, and we used to go fish off this bridge in, in this canal. And look, this is time. And, and it's just, it's not about the fishing. It's about the time. Because look, you, you know, you guys, some single guys or whatever, went out fishing um, this week. And like, look, when you're single, it's about catching fish. You know what I'm saying? It's about going out there and catching fish. When you have little kids, fishing is about wrecking fishing poles and throwing rocks. I'm surprised that that canal even has water in it. My kids are throwing so many rocks in that canal. And I mean, you get to the point where it's like, you know, this is just why we're here to throw rocks in, in the canal. You know, all you do is sit there. I mean, I would just put my pole away because all I'm doing is untangling lines and just like catching frogs that are jumping down the road. I mean, it's just, 
these are some like but these are some of the earliest memories that I even have as a kid is just fishing. You know, I mean these crazy stories. Friday, we're talking about this Friday, and Ashley, I remember this time we're out fishing uh, this canal, and Ashley, you know, she puts her pole on the on the side of the road, and it's got a little concrete thing there, and she's going and she's throwing rocks or she's chasing frogs down the road or whatever she's doing, and she comes up to me, she's like, Dad, you know, Dad, you know, I don't know, she's like this tall. So there's never too young to take him fishing, by the way. And she's like this tall, she's got a frog, and she's like, Dad, my fishing pole's gone. Fish got her pole, over the bridge it went, broke the line. So here we see this bobber floating down the river like this. We get in the pickup, and we, we lost the pole, but we caught the fish. You ever had that happen? So I mean, these are just the, the things, right? Like, look. But then they get a little bit older, and they figure some things out, and it goes back, you know, now, now you can catch fish again. Now you can catch fish again. Now you can, hey, now you can mend nets together. You see what I'm saying? You cast a line, it becomes catching fish. It becomes about catching fish again. But it's all about the time. It's all about the time. This is the first culture. You say, what, what's the culture you're talking about? Time. Spending time, that's the culture. That's the first one. Look, create that culture with your kids so it stays that way. And if you create that culture with your kids, it will never go away. You won't experience this, oh, my daughter turned 13 and went insane. You'll never experience that. You know, I mean, these people that say that to you, they're just like, hey, you know, what they're really saying in my mind is they're saying, hey, I'm a horrible parent. You know, when are you going to get to be a horrible parent so we can discuss our horrible parenting techniques together? I'm like, no. I'm going to do what the Bible says. I'm going to do the Bible way, and good luck with that. So, like, look, the first culture is time. Everything else builds from there. Like, from there, it, from there, it just becomes a culture of life. See? It becomes, look, not drinking is a culture. It's not a rule. You say, well, what do you mean? It, look, it, when, because when you're spending time with your kids, you use that time to have teachable moments. So when we come into the church and we have to step over some drunk guy, you think I don't, I mean, I'm going to use that for everything I possibly can. I'm going to get some mileage out of that situation. I'm going to be like, hey, want to be a drunk? You know, you want to be a drunk? You want to be a drug addict? Look at this guy. I mean, these are teachable moments, but guess what? You got to spend the time. You got to be with them. You got to have that life that you're walking through with them next to you. And those teachable moments will, will pop up. Look, I, I, I still remember a, a, a story my dad used to, t used to tell me. And it was, it was a story that his dad told him. Some guy came out to the farm to do business with my grandpa. And my dad was a little kid. And this guy was smoking a cigarette and doing business with my grandpa, and then he threw his cigarette on the ground, and then he, he left, they did their business, and he left. And my grandpa, he walks up to the cigarette with my dad, who was a little kid at the time, and there's a pile of manure, and there's this cigarette butt sitting right next to it. And my grandpa crushes the cigarette butt with his, with his boot right next to the pile of manure, and he looks at my dad and he says, kind of looks the same, doesn't it? See, that's establishing a culture. Smoking was like a huge, my grandpa would have beat me to death if I, he saw me smoking a cigarette. But we knew that, I mean, it, it established that culture. It was, a, it was a no smoking culture. I heard that story told to me, to, you know, to my kids I heard that story told to. But it's just, it's a, that's how you establish a culture because you're, you're, you know, his son was standing next to him in his life, in that business deal, and he created a teachable moment that created a culture. You want to put manure in your mouth, son? Does that sound good? No, that doesn't sound good. Makes sense. You get that buy-in, and then it becomes a culture for them. It's not just this set of random rules. I mean, look, this was the problem with Joash. It was just, you know, when, look, look, when they're young, when they're little kids, it's like, do what I say, or you're getting spanked. It's very simple. But when they get older, is when you start have, you know, you, you start you start teaching them the whys of the Bible. And that's how you create that culture.
But here's the rub. Here's the rub. And here's what I was thinking about this week. No matter how well you do it, you always could have done it better. So you think about that. Because look, time, you know, aside from what Einstein will tell you, time is not a variable. There's a lot in that statement, I'll just leave it there. But time is not something that is variable. It's fixed. The Bible tells us you can't control it. Once it's dumped out, it's on the ground. That's it. It's a vapor. So look, use it wisely. Use it wisely. You know, that's what Jonadab did. He spent the time. How do I know? Because of the results. That's how I know. And that's how people will know from your results. I mean, lasted generations. Think about it. Think of Zebedee. Think of the results there. Think of the sons of thunder in the Bible. James served to the death. John was, they tried to kill him. God saved him. And he gave us the book of Revelation. I mean, so yeah, there was a man that we don't hear about in the Bible, but we know he took the time because of what, you know, what we see from his children. So look, look, by the way, here's another thing. Time, time is in the here and now. Okay? Time is not in the in virtual world. Okay? Sometimes I wonder how much time people are spending in virtual world. Adults. Whether that be the internet or video games or whatever, right? I mean, look, here's the thing. Look, don't spiritualize spending time in virtual world. Oh, you say, but I, I just, I watch sermons. Guess what? When you're in virtual world, you're there by yourself. You're there by yourself. You're not there with anybody else. So don't spiritualize not spending, you know, time you need to with your family, because guess what? This hardwired thing that you have in your children, they will begin to despise the thing that keeps their dad from them. That's the danger. Oh, but I'm watching spiritual things. They will begin to despise those things. You're, you're walking dangerous ground there. Your wife and your kids are not on the internet. Period. They're in the here and now. Look, you can redo some things in life. Look, I glued something wrong the other day. I glued this thing, it didn't turn out right. And I was like, ah. Oh. And I mean, it was really good glue. I mean, I, but you can redo some things. I cut it out and I cleaned it all off and I re glued it. I retired from golf years ago. But guess what? In golf, you can take a ball again, you can hit another ball. But guess what? And I'm, you can't redo this. You can't redo this. You can't go back to when they're three and spend more time. You can't go back to when they're five and spend that time and keep that culture of spending time with them and showing them that they're the most important thing and, and creating that culture of life. Because these moments, these moments where you create this culture of not drinking, of not being part of the world, of all these things, they just pop up in these random situations. And you know what? When your kids are sp and you're spending that time and they ask you a million questions, you answer everyone. I mean, I, I went, I went to uh, on, a, on like a nine-hour trip with Jacob the other day, and it's just, like, it's just like question after question after question. And it's just like you just answer everyone. Why do this type of chickens have feathers that are brown and white, and this one has chicken feathers that are white? Um, uh, 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 you just come up with something. <laughs> but it's, see, these moments, these moments that you can't get back, they pop up at random times. Because guess what? In the questions about the chicken feather colors, there's going to be some real questions in there like, hey, why are certain people like this? Yeah. Hey, why did that guy, when you were talking to him, do that? That didn't seem right. They pop up in those times. And you can't get it back. 
Look, these men in the Bible that we're looking at this morning, their, this, the culture that they created in their family became their legacy. What will be your legacy? Think about that. No pressure. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for all the fathers in the room. I thank you for all the children, uh, Lord, in this church and in this room. I pray that um, you work in these families and you work with these fathers and you work with these children together that we can, we can just create some strong um, Christian culture in these young people. Lord, I know this is a huge responsibility for us. I ask that you just put your hand on us and just fill us with your spirit as we lead our families. And help us do um, you know, the best that we can at this, Lord, and just follow the clear instruction that you've given us in the Bible and the clear examples that you've given us in the Bible. Lord, we love you. We ask that you bless the rest of today and church this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.